America in Another World by Rhonda Black Cat Chapter 71 Operation Firestorm Part 7 0522 May 14, 2020 CE 0541 Sun 44, 196 AE Somewhere in the Elven Nation Agord had a grim look on his face as he gave an oral report to Terran. It's absolute chaos out there. We are still able to communicate with some of our units but we are just getting panicked reports from them. From what we could gather, we have lost a majority of our bases and our navy has mostly been sunk. We tried directly calling the air bases, naval bases, and army bases but most of them were unresponsive. However, the aircraft and ground units we have sheltered inside mountains have been untouched. Other than a few other units, the ones in the mountains are the only ones that haven't been attacked. Terran scratched his forehead while keeping his eyes shut. How did these humans know where to attack? Spies would make sense but they seem to know the location of everything. Even with spies, that would be impossible. Aerial reconnaissance would be improbable. We kept up a constant aerial patrol. Not a single scout plane should have been able to get through. Agord shook his head. I'm not sure, sir. How about the defenses we have set up? We also tried contacting those positions. Most were unresponsive but we got a few responses from survivors. We can conclude that most of them have been destroyed or heavily damaged. Terran tapped his desk and looked up at Agord. Operation Continued Arrow has started, correct. It's well underway. Sylphebel, Elven Nation. The sun had almost risen to the midway point. An elven officer stood on a hastily erected stand made out of crates. The humans have launched a surprise attack and snuck onto our shores. Most of our army is currently winning the war in the human homeland and is unable to return. It is time to serve your duty for your nation. It is time to destroy these inferiors who dare tread on our land. All able-bodied male veterans please line up first. Murmurs of suspicion arose from the crowd. For the past few hours, they had seen strange aircraft flying over the sky. Nonetheless, no one argued. Male veterans started lining up. Elven soldiers handed out rifles, pistols, machine guns, explosives, grenades, and portable anti-magi panzers. After they received their weapons, the officer spoke again to the veterans. We also have a few the guns. They are linked up to trucks outside of the town. Okay. Now, all able-bodied males. They were given everything that the veterans got except for the PAMs. All able-bodied female veterans. They were just given rifles, pistols, and grenades. All able-bodied females. They were handed rifles and pistols. For those with our new anti-magi panzer weapon, said the officer as he raised the PAM. We will have a demonstration on the field over there as to how to use them. The officer walked the male veterans to an open field. He coughed to bring the attention of everyone. This triangle cone on top of this tube is a rocket filled with magic particles set to explode. You just have to press this button under the tube to fire it. There is an iron sight on it to help you aim. These are to be used against any sort of vehicle and are not reusable. Fire them once and they can't be reloaded. The officer aimed the PAM and pressed the button under the tube. The rocket shot out and exploded a few hundred feet away. Orva Sialera Human Concentration Camp, Elven Nation. Damon conversed with Pablo in what used to be a guard house. Our job is to guard these people at all costs. We were given two options. Wait until our main force arrives or advance towards where the main force will be coming from. We will get air support via any nearby air units. Personally, I think the forest option is better. Pablo considered it for a second. Either way, we have an issue. With this amount of people in addition to the elves, I don't think we have the supplies to feed this many people. Good point. Damon nodded at Pablo's analysis. Good thing is is that the concentration camp here does have a lot of food. However, we don't really have the ability to bring it with us. There are trucks and cars here but it's gonna be hard traveling down the road hiding this many people. Hmm. It seems like we are staying. Damon opened the door and looked outside. Seems that way. We are going to be here for some days. Outside, their men ran around erecting a few defenses. 
Using shovels, they dug a trench at the front gate. 0644 May 14, 2020 CE. 0622 Sun 44, 196 AE. A couple miles from the shores of the Elven Nation. Nick pulled down his hatch and looked at his crew. Okay boys, we are hitting the beaches soon. The Air Force has been doing some bombing so I don't expect resistance to be heavy. A 1Z Vipers took off from the deck of the USS Bonhomme Richard and other amphibious assault ships. On the beach, smoke billowed from the destroyed fortifications. In one of the Vipers, a pilot spoke into his headphones. Anti-tank guns, infantry, and a couple of tanks. You are clear to fire. The 20mm M197 three-barreled rotary cannon that was on the front belly of the helicopter started spinning. Bullets soon spewed out onto the beach. Hydra 70 rockets flew out of the launchers on the side of the Viper. Explosions blanketed the area. An anti-tank gun position exploded. On the ground, elves ran around like ants. Nick felt his tank jolt as the LCAC he was on crashed into the sea. Uma looked up from his driver's seat at Nick. How many of these amphibious assaults have we done? Two. Uma scratched his head. I thought we did three. Nick waved him off. I don't quite remember. Anywhere between two to four. More than we need. A few minutes later, the LCAC that Nick's Abrams was in hit the beach and quickly deflated. The front gate opened down right as Uma put the pedal to the metal. A vein popped on Nick's head as the tank sped onto the sand. Connolly, goddammit, you nearly rammed us into the fucking LCAC. Above them, the A1Z Vipers, out of ammo, banked and turned back towards the large group of amphibious assault ships that were just offshore. Besides them, another LCAC came ashore and disgorged two M1A1S. On the M1A1S sides, AAVs came ashore. Bullets pinged off of the AAVs. Shots came from the stone rubble of fortifications. From the little turret of the AAVs, the MK-1940 mm automatic grenade launchers and the .50 Kel machine guns opened up at the rubble. Nick shouted at Dillian. We got enemy infantry direct front. Open up with the machine guns. Switching to thermals. The red-orange heat given off by the elves could be seen in the camera feed that Dillian was looking through. The machine guns on Nick's Abrams opened up on the elves hiding behind the rubble. Under the cover of fire, marines rushed out from the open back doors of the AAVs. They positioned themselves behind the armored vehicles and started firing. The fire from the elves slackened as bullets poured down on them. A tank shell exploded on the cheek of Nick's Abrams. A knight had peeked out from a small hill. Nick shouted again at Dillian. Tank one o'clock. Firing. The round went right into the turret of the knight. In a flash, the knight's turret exploded and was flung into the sky. Advance. Their Abrams whirred to life and started moving forwards. Behind them, MV-22 Osprey landed onto the beachhead and more marines ran out. Small arms fire from the elves peppered the advancing armored vehicles. The A1ZS sped past overhead and headed deeper into land. They began clearing the way for the advancing ground forces. Marines moved up to the rubble and took cover behind them. The supporting M1A1S and AAVs gunned down any nearby elves that appeared or started shooting. Sergeant Finn Johnson, sitting behind a piece of rubble, looked over his shoulder. Bullets from a machine gun whizzed past him. The rest of his squad was crouched with him. Finn nodded his head over the rubble. Got a machine gunner there. Blake, give me suppressing fire. I'm gonna throw a grenade over. Got it, sir. Private Blake York peeked out from the other side of the rubble and opened up with his M4 rifle. Finn stood up and tossed a grenade over where the machine gun fire had come from. He quickly ducked back down and Blake returned to cover. An explosion came from where he chucked the grenade and with that... The hail of bullets stopped. However, singular bullets still whizzed by. Machine gunner down but we got some rifle fire. A fusillade of machine gun fire was heard. An M1A1 had opened up with its machine guns on the elves that were firing on them. The rest of Finn's platoon peeked out of cover and started firing. It wasn't long before Nick's Abrams was off the sand and onto the dirt. 
Something pinged off the sloped front of the tank. Anti-tank gun 11 o'clock. An anti-tank gun was sitting in a dugout position just to the left of them. It had sandbags surrounding it. Near it was multiple already destroyed anti-tank guns. Firing. The high explosive slammed into the anti-tank gun just as its crew reloaded. The gun exploded and its crew was vaporized in the combined blast. Port city of Elysory, Elven Nation. Era sat down. In the room were the current commanding officers of the army units in Elysory. They were all survivors of the failed invasion. Usually, this divisional meeting would be a meeting of major generals and lieutenant generals but some of the elves ranked as low as captain were also participating. Captain Fenno Dagler, current commander of what's left of the 7th Infantry Division started the meeting. The naval base. It's completely gone. Colonel G. Ulysses Keenower, commander of what's left of the 21st Magi Panzer Division, dishearteningly commented, You saw the planes right. Femo nodded. They are the exact same ones as those that attacked us in the Empire. The humans are already here. High command is gone. We can't reach them. Era sighed and interjected. They are doing the same thing. Giulis looked at her questionably. What do you mean? Their basic strategy is to cut off the head and let the body writhe in confusion. We experienced that when they destroyed our bases in the Empire. Have we received any exact orders or reports? We did receive some panicked messages. We know that this is occurring across the country. The humans are bombing everything. Nothing is clear yet though. Era nodded. I suggest we retreat. Lieutenant General Aylred Farah, commander of the 34th Infantry Division and one of the few higher ranked in the meeting, disagreed. Isn't it better if we fortify our position? Era looked down at the map that was on the table. She pointed to the mountain range that divided the south from the north. This is the best place to set up a defense. Aylred scoffed. We are all the way on the southern tip and you are expecting us to move hundreds of miles across land that's under attack by the human aircraft. Era shook her head. We will not move as one. We will move in multiple small groups. The humans would most likely attack large numbers of units setting up defenses than small numbers retreating. How are you certain? I'm not. I'm betting on it. It's our only real chance of putting up a fight. You experienced what happened when we tried to defend cities against these humans. Chapter 72, Into the Hornet's Nest. 0910 May 14, 2020 CE. 0735 Sun 44, 196 AE. Near the shore of the Elven Nation. By the end of the day, the Marines had secured a beachhead spanning miles. Nick sat in his Abrams while keeping an eye out for any threats. The anti-tank gun fired and the shell ricocheted off of the Abrams' cheek. After Nick turned the turret towards the anti-tank gun, Dillian quickly dispatched it with a single shot. We just destroyed an anti-tank gun. I think the town can be considered hostile. Over. We are just a couple of minutes behind. Hold until we get there. Out. AAVs and Humvees pulled up right beside the Abrams. Marines exited their vehicles and started moving into town. Nick's Abram followed the infantry as they entered the town. The AAVs and Humvees lined up right behind. Although the town seemed empty, the air felt tense to Nick. This town doesn't feel right. Uma commented nonchalantly. I guess the civilians evacuated. Nick wondered to himself. Then why was there an anti-tank gun right outside of the town? I dunno. Maybe they were a part of the defenses that they had set up. Brian, the loader, interjected. Well so far, considering the lack of noise, the houses should be empty. The infantry was kicking open the doors to the surrounding houses on the street. So far, there was no sound of battle. Uma laughed. We are in a tank and fighting a country that can't even field modern weaponry. What are we so worried about? Brian shrugged. It's still a war. Who knows what could happen? Shots rang out. Nick wrinkled his nose. More shooting started. Finn slammed his back to a wall beside him as soon as he saw the partially concealed machine gun peeking out of a house's window. Machine gun. It opened up and wildly sprayed bullets at them. Finn returned fire with the rest of his squad. From another window, 
A grenade was lobbed towards them. It landed right beside Blake. Ah fuck. Blake knew that what was shown in movies and video games where people just threw back grenades was utter bullcrap. Grenades only had around a 3 to 5 second fuse and he wasn't superhuman. Blake dived for the ground. A few seconds went by and no explosion occurred. From his prone position, he looked back at the grenade. Oh, they forgot to pull the pin. Finn got his back on the wall next to the door that led into the house where the grenade came from. He threw a flashbang in. Hearing it go off, he burst in with two others from his squad. Seeing armed elves covering their eyes, Finn started shooting. They cleared the living room in no time. Shots rang out from the stairs. Whoever was firing seemed to be randomly firing at the first floor. Johnson, get your team and keep us covered downstairs. The rest of you guys in here, we are going up. Some guy is trying to blind fire or something. I'm throwing a grenade up. Finn tossed one upstairs and it clinked onto the ground of the second floor. Shouting was heard and then an explosion. Finn moved up first followed by his men. Two bodies laid strewn on the ground. I'm checking the first door. They methodically checked each room of the house which in the end were all clear. One of Finn's men, Curtis Sheridan, stared at one of the dead bodies. They are just fucking civilians. Blake seemed to come to an understanding. Explains why that pin wasn't pulled. Finn shook his head. This feels just like I'm back in Afghanistan. Blake nodded. Well, at least there aren't any children. I hope it stays that way. Multiple gunshots rang out from outside the house. Finn patted Curtis who was still staring at the body. Okay, we don't have time to chit chat. Let's move. We still have a job to do. Nix Abrams moved up the road. A firefight was occurring between US infantry and elves who were taking cover behind a makeshift barricade. Firing and he, the barricade exploded. Nick and Dillian opened up with the machine guns on the tank at the surviving elves. Something flew towards the Abrams at high speeds. It exploded on the glassy plate of the tank. Connolly shouted. Is that an anti-tank gun? Nick shrugged. I don't see anything. Well, it didn't damage the tank, keep moving forward. Finn ran to his platoon leader, 2nd Lieutenant Albury Gray, who was standing outside with another squad of their platoon. Albury had split the platoon in order to cover more houses. Finn shouted over the gunshots. Sir, we cleared out the house. Killed a couple of elves in there. Seemed to be armed civvies. What's happening out there? Same thing as you got. Armed civvies. Now, we got a Humvee coming as support. There are reports that the elves got barricades and cover set up on the streets all around town. The Humvee is gonna help a lot. I want you and your squad to keep the Humvee covered. We got lots of elves further ahead. The rest of the platoon will clear out the nearby houses. Got it, sir. It wasn't long before the Humvee pulled up. Finn slapped the side of the Humvee a couple of times. We got ya yeah covered. The rest of our platoon is clearing the houses further up. The .50 Kel gunner started eyeing the windows further ahead. Bullets pinged off the Humvee as shots came from the second floor of a house up ahead. Fuck. Get down. The .50 Kel gunner blasted the window where the shots came from. With the nearby houses cleared, they moved up the road. RPG. A rocket slammed into the front of the Humvee. Finn and the rest of the squad were flung to the ground. His ears rang and his surroundings looked blurry. He put his hand down on the ground as he tried to get up. He heard shooting and a lot of gunshots. A soldier, he wasn't sure who, helped him up and got him into cover. Gaining back his senses, he took in his surroundings. One of the men in his squad, Private Dave Hunts, was screaming as he clutched his left leg which was clearly blown off. Motherfucker, what was that? The elves have RPGs. Dave? Hold on we are getting you out of here. We need a case of ac. This zone's too fucking hot. Carry him out of here first. We don't want the heli to get blown out of the sky. Bullets whizzed around as elves in plain cloth popped out and started firing. An hour later, Finn sat in a chair in one of the houses as he munched on his MRE which was some sort of meat in barbecue sauce. Corporal Johnson looked very pissed. 
It was obvious why. Dave was one of the men in his team. When the fuck did the elves get fucking RPGs? Blake responded while eating his MRE. Well, I guess today. And they gave them to fucking civilians. Curtis cut in. Is Dave gonna be alright? Blake shrugged. Not sure. Man, he still has a wife and kids at home. A silence filled the room as they ate their rations. The silence was soon broken by Curtis. Those were civilians weren't they? Blake looked over. Yep. It was clear that Curtis didn't look too well and you guys are okay with this. Finn sighed. After the first house that they had cleared, Curtis seemingly started to put in less effort. Well terrorists were once civilians and we shot them without a blink of an eye. Look soldier, Finn stood up. If they are armed and trying to kill you, you gotta kill them or they are gonna kill your friends. Curtis still looked upset. Some of them were women. I know this is different from what you have been experiencing so far. You have only been deployed for a year but it's no different from the old world. You see most of us here. We were deployed to Camp Dwyer in Afghanistan. We had to kill kids sometimes. Nobody wants to kill a kid. But when you have one running at you and your friends with a bomb strapped to their chest, you gotta do what you have to do. Blake shook his head. At least the elves in this town haven't armed their kids. We got ten who are probably orphans now. At this, Curtis looked uneasy again. Finn stared unhappily at Blake. Near Port City of Elysory, Elven Nation. Era set out in her night with another knight and two stallions. A few platoons of infantry and magipanzers have already set off earlier. It wasn't long before she came upon the damage wrought by the humans. From her open commander's hatch, she scanned the blackened fields of destroyed magipanzers and the guns. What was this all for? She said to no one in particular. Staring at the destruction, she thought back to her childhood. At only 59, she was still a young elf so it wasn't hard. She remembered how she was taught that the world was destined to be for the elves. How she learned about the inferiority of humans. There was even a mandatory class studying the shortcomings of the humans. Their magic was inferior. Their technology was inferior. They were just inferior beings. She remembered how she was so excited when she had joined the army and learned that they were preparing to invade the humans. To finally defeat an enemy that she had learned to curse at from youth. Looking at the scene in front of her brought her much anger but also a lot of doubt. She was scared of the doubt growing in her. In fact, she hated it. To doubt something she had believed her whole life. She pushed it to the back of her head. Chapter 73, Siops and Delusions of Grandeur. 1022 May 14th, 2020 CE. 0811 Sun 44th, 196 AE. Nia Nallery, Elven Nation. Elves bustled around in the big city. Although they were in plain clothes, they carried all sorts of weapons. Most of them set up sandbags. Some of the elves who have earth magic set up small walls to close off streets. Inside a grocery store, Alien Morvaris, the shopkeeper, conversed with his friend and regular customer, Elwyn Luidra. I don't believe what that officer said one bit. It sounds ridiculous. What military would invade with such force when they are being invaded? Those planes in the sky are definitely not ours. Elwyn frowned. Even if he was lying, I would never allow a human to step onto our soil unless they are coming here as a slave. Do we even have to treat them that bad? The shock on Elwyn's face grew into anger. You are actually sympathizing with those trash, right? Look at how their ears aren't pointy. It looks disgusting, who would have round ears? Also, I can easily raise walls. A human can't do that. And they can't even live past 100 years. If they aren't cursed beings only suitable as slaves, then I don't know what is. Elwyn started to come down and looked sadly at Alien. Look, we have been good friends and I hope this is a one-time thing. I don't want to do this to you. However, if you truly believe it, I will tell everyone and you know what happens right. Elwyn stared at Alien menacingly. Alien gulped and nodded. Sorry, I just got scared of the human weapons and the fact that they are invading us. Elwyn made a wide smile. It's fine. We will beat them back. You have nothing to worry about. Now, 
Can I get some flour? A whirring sound filled the air. The elves looked up and pointed at the plane. Some started to murmur while others ran for cover. The C-130 started descending and soon flew at a stable and low altitude. Nearing the city, its back door opened. Paper spewed out and started fluttering to the ground. Elves cautiously picked up the papers and looked at them. On one side, the picture of a battlefield was shown on top. It was a view of many destroyed elven magi panzers and dead elves. Right below the picture was this message. Attention people of the elven nation. Almost all of your military forces have been destroyed. Do not take up arms. Our forces do not wish to harm the innocent civilians of the elven nation. The government of the United States of America guarantees the safety and well-being of all peaceful civilians. On the other side of the leaflet was a four-panel drawn picture. The top left panel showed an elf with a bolt-action rifle. An arrow went to the top right panel which showed the elf dead. On the bottom left panel was an elf without a weapon. An arrow went to the bottom right panel which showed an alive elf. With most of the air cleared out and more available aircraft, the U.S. began their shops. In multiple elven cities, these messages were dropped. In addition to the C-130S, F-15E Strike Eagles dropped PDU-5B dispenser units. The dispenser units burst in midair and spread the leaflets. 1,155 May 14, 2020 CE. 0827 Sun 44, 196 AE. J. Onor, Elven Nation. Alashran Elykian stood with his back against a wall. His older brother, Almer Elykian, stood beside him. Although they were both cooks with no military experience, they were proud to fight for their country. The noise of a tank was heard right around the corner. Alashrin shouted to his older brother, There's a tank. I got the Pam. Firing. The rocket shot out at the Abrams. It hit the side of it and an explosion went off. The smoke quickly cleared and the Abrams's turret turned towards the two elves. Almer's eyes widened. Run. Machine gun fire cut them down. Orva Sialara Human Concentration Camp, Elven Nation. Pablo leaned back in the chair. You think we are going to be attacked any time soon? Damon shrugged. Well, you never know. It's been more than an entire day and there has not been any presence of an elven force within a few mile radius. We can probably be evac'd soon. Depends on how much progress the marines are making. Well even if this is a concentration camp, this kind of feels like a vacation. Damon started laughing. A Green Beret calling being in a concentration camp a vacation. Kind of ironic isn't it with your motto to liberate the oppressed? Pablo chuckled. Anyways, with their country being invaded, do you think they will even have time to care about their concentration camps going offline? I won't be surprised if they don't even know we took this over. They have bigger issues. Washington, D.C. President Hayes shook his head. I will not authorize the bombing of civilians. These are just towns and cities. If it's a political building or something of military value inside a civilian area, then fine. But I'm not going to authorize the bombing of random streets. Krilson slammed the table. Mr. President, our soldiers are dying fighting these elves on the streets. It seems that almost all of them have taken up arms. Remember the media has an eye on this war. They threw a fit when I didn't allow them to report on the outside world for the first few months. There are going to be a lot of war correspondents for this invasion. Just continue attacking military targets. If, if the situation worsens, then I will consider it. J. Onor, Elven Nation. Finn leaned against the wall. The Elven military was the least of their concerns now. This was their second town. A bit smaller than the last one but many of the civilians fought to the death. Heard the armies coming. Johnson nodded. For once I'm fucking glad they are here. These elves are suicidal. How's Curtis doing? He's, doing alright I guess. I don't like the pause there. Johnson shook his head while looking at his feet. Well, it hasn't improved. I know. He's still new. I probably should go talk to him again. Finn walked towards where the rest of his men were resting. You guys holding up well? I don't like this either. 
We are basically exterminating these people. Well, these elves. Blake took a swig of his water. Well, let's just think of them as terrorists. Nothing changed. They just have pointy ears now and even worse weapons. Finn sat down beside Curtis. Through the background noise, there was a moment of silence between them. Curtis, why did you join the Marines? Quite a cliche story actually I guess. I was almost gonna graduate high school and I still had no idea what I was going to do. My scores weren't that magnificent and going to a state college didn't really appeal to me. Really didn't want to go into debt getting a useless degree. I was quite bored so I just decided to join the Marines. By chance, after I finished training, we were transported to this world. Finn sighed and looked at Curtis. Well, the military isn't for everyone. If you can't take it anymore, just talk to me. Elven Nation. Anfalen burst in after knocking on the door. My leader. The humans are spreading propaganda from the sky. Look at this. He threw the leaflets onto Terran's desk. Terran read them for a minute and looked up. His fist slammed the table. Get me to the Magi radio room. The last time he made a speech was before the elven invasion of the humans. He knew exactly what to say. The Magi radio operator switched to the public channel and spoke. Terran gripped his microphone for a few seconds before starting to speak. He shouted into the microphone with force and anger. These wretched humans have landed onto the shores of our beautiful country. Will we let these animals encroach on our sacred haven? Will we turn our backs to our destiny? Will the superior species be subjugated by an inferior one? The prophecy has foretold of the demons and their weapons. It is clear here that the humans are working with the demons. The demons, the forces of evil, aim for the destruction of all of us. The uncivilized humans are mere pawns of the demons. But rest assured, our military is preparing a counterattack. The reserves are being mobilized. Weapons of wonder developed by our scientists are being brought out. Magi panzers with impenetrable armor. Planes that can fly nearly at the speed of sound. Rockets that can fly hundreds of miles and accurately hit their targets. Continue your resistance against these pests. They may have demonic weapons but our weapons are a match. You are the superior species. You have the most superior magic. You have the most ideal bodies. Your souls are blessed by our goddess to tame this world. Do not falter. Nia Nallery, Elven Nation. In the streets, elves that had crowded around the public magi radios nodded. Murmurs arose. That would explain those planes. My goodness, the humans working with the demons of prophecy. Just how evil can these humans become? Burn these papers. Burn these lies. The crowd turned into a sea of fury. Elves started ripping apart the Siop leaflets. Some threw them into fires while others conjured up small flames. Bombarded with propaganda for hundreds of years, taught to always listen to their leader, and to consider humans to be no more than animals, most could not see that they were clearly being lied to. Only a minority knew better and they dared not to speak. Terran did not need a secret police because the citizens themselves were the secret police. Terran took a deep breath. In his mind, Terran assured himself that they would win. He put his trust into the superweapons that they still have yet to use. As long as they could beat the Americans back, they could win. They just needed to fight them until they couldn't fight anymore. He truly thought that it was his destiny to fulfill his father's vision. He left the Magi radio room and made his way directly to the military room. It was a large room filled with desks and maps. Terran approached Agord. Have we re-established contact with most of the surviving units? Yes, sir, most of them. The situation doesn't look good at all though. Let me take a look. What units are functioning? And what are not? A large map on the table showed the entire elven nation. Agord placed objects onto the map. He showed the positions of each surviving unit and their conditions. After a very thorough and detailed showing, Terran gathered his top generals. Colonel General Vudun Roken proposed his idea. My leader, we are thinking of a spread-out defense. The human's air force is very capable of destroying massed forces. By spreading them out, we will make it harder for the human aircraft to destroy our units. 
they will have to hunt them down one by one. The spread out units will support the citizens who are fighting back. General of the Infantry Ryo Mayahorn shot back instantly. I propose that we retreat to the mountains. It's a natural defense and is much more easily guarded. Colonel General Roken's plan just causes unnecessary casualties and only weakens us. A unified force at an easily defended place is better. Vuden scoffed. We will be losing nearly half the country if we do so. Terran pondered for a bit. I see merit in both of your statements. But I believe that General of the Infantry Mayahorn's plan is more sensible. However, we shall not lose our territory without a fight. We will use Colonel General Roken's plan here. We will organize a few units for a spread out defense. If it works well, we will call back our retreating units. If not, then most of our men will be able to fight another day as they would have already retreated. Ryo smirked at Genera. Genera narrowed his eyes. Because of their constantly conflicting strategies and opinions, they had been rivals ever since they were both major generals. When Genera was promoted to Colonel General, Ryo threw a fit. Chapter 74, 2nd Battalion, 37th Armored. 0044 May 15, 2020 CE. 0322 Sun 45th, 196 AE. He is currently following an element of the 1st Armored Division. Mason Booker, to you, the TV screen changes to a person standing on the deck of a ship. A few seconds of silence follow. As you can see the soldiers here are preparing to deploy a lot of these smaller boats towards the shore. Is this anything on the shore? The camera pans towards the shore. Nothing. It's only an empty beach. Much earlier I saw multiple of what I believe to be American jets fly over. Seems like the landing ships are departing. The camera swivels to where the ships are departing the Oak Hill. Off the shore of the Elven Nation. Multiple ships pulled up to the beaches. The largest of them all, the USAV Major General Robert Smalls and USAV Major General Charles P. Gross, landing ship vessels, dropped down its front door. One by one, a total of 28 M1A2 Abrams, two armored companies worth of tanks, rolled off. This made up the entire tank force of the 2nd Battalion, 37th Armored Regiment. The 2nd Battalion, 37th Armored Regiment was one of the Armor Combined Arms Battalion of the 1st Armored Brigade Combat Team. It was made up of two armored companies and one mechanized rifle company. Besides the landing ship vessels, many LCUs, LCACs, and LCMs came ashore. From them, infantry jumped onto the beach. Humvees, M113A3 APCs, and M2A3 Bradleys also drove ashore from them. Multiple Harpers Ferry-class dock landing ships and Whidbey Island-class dock landing ships could be seen further out at sea still disgorging LCUs, LCACs, and LCMs. Isak was among the infantry inside the M2A3 Bradleys coming ashore. He was part of the mechanized rifle company of the 2nd Battalion, 37th Armored Regiment. The 1st Armored Brigade Combat Team was the first army unit to land on Elven shores. More army units were coming but there was a limited number of military transport ships. A lot would have to come by civilian contracted ships. J. Onor, Elven Nation. Johnson shook his head. Two towns of hell and we have to fight our way through a major port city now. This is going to be a pain in the ass. The populace is just too hostile. I would prefer fighting the Taliban than this. Blake frowned. Then why are we attacking a major port city? Seems like the army is using civilian contractors to get more things ashore. The civilian ships don't have amphibious capabilities. They need a port. Ah, the fucking army. Makes sense. We are definitely not going to be able to do this by ourselves. A brigade combat team from the 1st Armored is coming to assist. They should have already landed. Elven Nation. Terran frowned as the officers of his general staff bickered about his decision yesterday. He had no intention to intervene. Yet. The voices of his generals mixed together. It was hard to distinguish who was speaking what but it was clear what they were saying. I protest this. We will be abandoning the civilians if we do. To lose so much land is ridiculous. The civilians are doing a worthy sacrifice. Even to a limited degree, 
we will still be assisting them. Do you dare question our leader? But for us to run away is undignified. Dignity or not, it's important to ensure the survival of the nation. This isn't a fight for survival, we just have to find a way to beat them back. The civilians that make up this nation are the nation. To abandon them is to abandon this nation. Then they would understand that they have to do this. They are fighting for themselves. We must reconsolidate our forces. We barely have a chain of command left. Sounding an all retreat to regroup and reorganize is important. It isn't an all retreat. There are units that have been specifically commanded to continue resisting. We need to delay the enemy whilst we retreat. Terran coughed and the room fell silent. I understand your concerns but my decision is final. We will conduct a retreat with some left behind to delay the enemy. The civilians must also fight for their country. 0206 May 15, 2020 CE. 0403 Sun 45th, 196 AE. Nithna's Forest, Elven Nation. The Nithna's Forest was a small forest that was only a few miles away from the sea. It was beside a major road that led to the port city of Philinias. In the forest, two elves sat on rocks and pointed at the map they laid out on the ground. Around them multiple tents were set up and two knights sat idle nearby. A few magi tracks and magi trucks were scattered around. They were what remained of the 29th Magi Panzer Division. They were mostly survivors from the 13th Tract Infantry Regiment and 4th Magi Panzer Regiment. Colonel Tinaran Alayfarin of the 4th Magi Panzer Regiment laid out his plan. Our recon forces have reported that we have human forces advancing through here. The sun's going down soon. A night attack would be able to catch them off guard. We are well hidden, they wouldn't even know what happened before it's too late. Major Alisa Christjor of the 13th Tract Infantry Regiment nodded. We will form a line on this edge of the forest right beside the road. A knight will stay there with its engines turned off. Once the human convoy reaches the end of our line, we will all open fire. The knight will come out from the back of the convoy and block their retreat. Just a textbook ambush. Nothing complicated. Sounds good. 25 minutes later. Tinaran crouched down beside Alisa. This is perfect. The moon isn't bright today. We are completely concealed. The elves occupied a stretch of forest that bordered the road. Only the sound of crickets could be heard as they waited silently in the darkness. It wasn't long before they heard a whirring sound. The gunner in the lead Abrams spoke up. I'm seeing some movement up ahead. Multiple elves, there's a tank. They are hiding in the trees. Switching to thermals. The lead Abrams came to a halt. An elf observed the human convoy. He saw the lead Magi Panzer suddenly halt. He whispered to the soldier beside him. They stopped. Why did they stop? Did they see us? They couldn't have. It's even hard to see them. Gunshots and explosions came over them. A shout came from somewhere the night has been destroyed. How did they see us? Retreat. Get deeper into the forest. They can't get us in this dark. Their second knight came out a mile down the road in front of the lead Abram. It fired a shot. The driver tried to back up the Abrams but it only started circling right. The track is damaged. There's an elven tank in front of us. They got our track. The second Abrams in the convoy pulled off to the side of the road and aimed towards the knight. A shot destroyed the knight. Isaac snored with his arms crossed and head leaning back against the metal wall of the crew compartment of the Bradley. He was shaken awake by his staff sergeant, Jacob who had been sitting beside him. We found a bunch of elves trying to ambush us. Get your NVG and Repare to get out. Because of his sore neck, Isaac shook his head from left to right. Stay back and stay in your tank. The Abrams and Bradleys swiveled toward the forest. The .50 calories on the Abrams and 25mm chain gun on the Bradley opened up. Heavy machine gunfire came from the elves. I'm seeing half-tracks in the forest. Three Magi tracks laid down heavy machine gun fire at the Bradleys and Abrams. The Magi bullets flashed through the air like bolts of electricity. They pinged off of the surfaces of the American armored vehicles. Using thermals, the Abrams and Bradleys could clearly see the Magi tracks. 
Rounds from a Bradley's chain gun punctured holes into one of the Magi tracks which blew up a second after. The remaining two Magi tracks were quickly dealt with by the Abrams. The rapid fire of machine guns died down. With their front facing the forest, the back doors of the Bradleys opened. Isaac and his squad ran out. They positioned themselves besides their Bradley and towards the forest before opening up. Jacob yelled. We are moving up. Be careful. It's vital that we clear them out. Don't want an ambush happening because we left a couple of them. A bullet whizzed past and someone cussed. Open fire. The elves started panicking once more when the humans seemed to know where they were. How can they see us? Ack. Shoot back. I can't see them. Retreating back to the camp, Alisa shouted at Tinaran. They can see us at night. Tinaran threw his hands up in disbelief. How? Are they even humans? I don't know sir. They are coming. Get to the trucks we need to get out of here. I'm not fighting monsters who can see at night. The Bradleys and Abrams, supported by the infantry, advanced deeper into the forest. They soon came upon a clearing that had a few tents set up. A large amount of bullets started whizzing past the infantry. Many pinged off of the Abrams and Bradleys. Isaac got his back to a tree. Someone shouted out. I'm hit. Isaac could see elves piling onto their magi trucks. A few elves stood in the open, firing their rifles and submachine guns. The Abrams opened up on the magi trucks while the Bradleys ripped apart the elves in the open. Isaac peeked out of his cover and shot the nearest elf. He watched as a magi truck exploded from being hit by an he shot from an Abrams. Bodies of the elves in the back of that magi truck were flung around. Some laid burning on the ground. The fighting soon died down. Forest is entirely clear. Move back to the roads. A few minutes later. Get the maintenance platoon up here. One of Grizzly 2-2's tracks is bust. An engineer studied the broken track. Staff Sergeant Harry Bellow looked at the engineer. Is it bad? Shouldn't take long to fix. Quite lucky. It's only the track that broke. The wheels are fine. The convoy stayed halted on the road to deal with the damage suffered. It wasn't long before they started moving again. Elven Nation. Terran walked into the office of the Advancement Department. He walked up to Ilrun Helleran, the new head of Advancement. Ilrun was the vice head of Advancement until Ruener met his demise when an American bomb struck the High Command office. Is it almost ready? Ilrun nodded. Yes but there is going to be an issue when it comes to crossing bridges. It's too heavy even for our metal ones. Then just go around them. It's also excruciatingly slow. Terran frowned. I don't care as long as it can reach the Americans. Understood sir. Terran walked out into the hallway. There, Anna Falen ran to him. My leader. Terran raised his eyebrow. What is it Anne Falen? I, I don't believe we can win sir. Terran laughed. I know the situation looks bleak but don't worry. The Americans' technology is much too superior to ours. I have been compiling and studying a list of the Americans' capabilities. They are not a few years ahead. Based on our past speed of development, the Americans are at least 300 years ahead. Remember, it took us 150 years to get from our first Magipanzers and submarines to the current ones we have. Terran nodded and smiled. I agree, but you see, the speed of our development is increasing. Our budget has become more and more focused on technological development. In just a few years, we created a plane superior to the propeller plane. Although it couldn't beat the Americans, I have just unleashed my newest weapon on the Americans. This one should have an effect. But sir, isn't it too late? Terran waved him off. Nonsense. Elves are a superior species. I believe in our inner superiority. We have the resolve and confidence to fight on. The humans will tire out one day and that shall be our victory. Sir, resolve and confidence can't win a war. Terran frowned. Your continued opposition upsets me Anfalen. You should watch what you say. Anfalen froze. Understood, sir. Good. Good. Also, Anfalen, just know that you are very important to me. It would sadden me if something happened to you. Terran walked away. Chapter 75, 
Human Slaves. 0245 May 15, 2020 CE. 0422 Sun 45th, 196 AE. On a road in the Elven Nation. Inside his M2A3 BFV, Lt. Col. Manuel Linda, Commander of the 6th Squadron, 1st Cavalry Regiment of the 1st ABCT, listened over the radio to the shouting of Lt. Col. Rogers, Commander of the 2nd Battalion, 3rd Armored Regiment. They had their camp in the forest. We were nearly ambushed on the route. A recon section had swept through that area. Dismounted infantry covered that forest and had also reported it to be clear. How big was the camp? They had around five large tents and a couple of vehicles. Where was it? Couple miles into the forest. The recon section missed it most likely. I can't guarantee that every single forest in your path has been combed through. You didn't take any casualties did you? Only a few injuries. We saw them hiding on the edge of the forest before they could do anything. I will need another cavalry troop to actually comb through the entire area and find every single elf. Any force that we don't find should be minuscule enough that it won't greatly hinder your advance. Remember, we are doing security for your rear and flanks too. 2 M2A3 Bradleys, a section from the 6th Squadron, 1st Cavalry Regiment, traveled speedily down the road. They came to an abrupt halt as something appeared ahead. Dismount and stop it. Be careful, it could be an IED. Soldiers came out of the back of the Bradleys and aimed their guns at the car. One of them waved at the car. The car came to an abrupt halt and quickly turned around. Seems to be a civilian. I do hope they haven't invented car IEDs. Although there were highways, most of the roads were usually devoid of cars. The elves that they had encountered so far have all ran away in fear. Outside the port city of Philonia's, Elven Nation. Thirty minutes later, the two Bradleys came to a halt once again. The lead Bradley's driver looked up at his commander. So this is the city. Yap. There doesn't seem to be a military presence. Oh, wait. I'm seeing sandbags. Also armed civilians. Well, I heard that the partisans are giving the marines hell. There's a lot of them too. I can see that. Guess they are waiting for us. How much you want to bet that those cars were scouts? Let's keep our distance. Heard they got some sort of RPG. Port city of Philonias. The water from the faucet ran onto Renaud Hankin's hands as he scrubbed the dishes of his master, an old and rich male elf. Elves could be heard everywhere outside of the house he was in. They were all talking, walking around, and setting up structures. The entire city was in an uproar. Renaud feared for his life since every elf seemed to be armed with weapons. Renaud glanced over at a piece of paper on the kitchen counter. He was pretty sure this was what convinced his master to buy him. He couldn't read it but the picture on it clearly showed a human acting like a butler to an elf lounging around. Every elf a king? Buy your own personal human servant? Assign it to any menial job. Make it do anything you want. It will serve your every need. You will not be penalized for torturing, raping, or killing your human. Prices vary. As Renaud set down the plates, he looked around. He was alone in the kitchen but he didn't dare run away. Some people had foolishly tried to run thinking that it was easy since security was lax. All of them were caught and slowly tortured to death. He didn't want to suffer a similar fate. 0327 May 15, 2020 CE 0443 Sun 45th, 196 AE. Outside the port city of Philonias, Blake gazed at the port city of Philonias. The tallest building in the city seemed to be just three stories. If not for the number of buildings, it would have felt like a small town. Blake sighed and looked at Finn. If this was anything like the last two towns, this entire city is going to be hostile. Is there no way we can just flatten parts of it with artillery and airstrikes? Well, I'm not ranked high enough to decide that. Blake shrugged. Just asking for an opinion. Hmm. Probably not. It's too dense. Artillery is out of the question and any bombing run, no matter how accurate, will cause collateral damage. But we are pretty sure that most of the elves will be hostile. Finn shook his head. Not a good enough reason for those that are watching. 
pretty sure we have journalists embedded with us. Curtis definitely isn't going to like this battle. I'm gonna need to refer Curtis to the psychologist soon. Pretty sure we have one attached with us. He's probably gonna be beyond my help if this gets worse. He seems back to his normal self as of right now. He's quite a soft guy. He's still a Marine. Jacob got out of the Bradley and turned to Isaac and the rest of the squad. We will be advancing into the city at 1300. Isaac glanced at a person getting out of a Humvee behind them. The person was wearing a blue covered vest. Ah, the media's here. Port city of Philonias. Renaud kept his head down as his master walked by and glanced at the dishes. Now take out the garbage. He was glad that his master spoke to him in common. Even though his master knew how to speak common, he had been hit multiple times for not understanding the elven language. Renaud walked out of the house carrying a bag of garbage. Seeing the armed elves walking by, he wanted to shrink himself so he couldn't be seen. Continuing on, he then saw an elf family walking by, a mother and father watching their daughter prancing around. His heart hurt a bit. He missed and worried for the well-being of his younger sister, mother, and father. They had been separated when they were processed and given different jobs. His family came from a quaint rural town. By luck or not, his town was in the area where the elves started taking slaves. If he had lived closer to the ocean, he and his family would most likely have died. He had seen the corpses of the people of the towns closer to the ocean. However, if he had lived farther, he probably would still be home tending to his family's farm. His stomach growled thinking of the food he would be eating back home. His master barely fed him. But he preferred this over the hard labor he would have endured if he wasn't selected to be a servant. The humans are here. They have Magipanzers. Prepare to defend our homes. Don't let these humans through. Two elven soldiers ran past shouting. Renaud watched them run deeper into the city. He remembered that there used to be a lot of soldiers here but most of them disappeared for some reason. All around him, other elves started running in the other direction. They seemed to tighten their hold on their weapons. For some reason, Renaud felt a bit of hope in his heart. Surrounding the city, elements of the 2nd Marine Division and 1st ABCT prepared to launch an assault on the city. Yaren, Magus Imperium. M4 Shermans drove onto the Magus transport ship. American infantry on the dock watched in curiosity at the procession of what was the workhorse of the U.S. Army in World War II. Well thank God the Magus aren't using our ships. We already have enough trouble transporting our own stuff over. Quite interesting isn't it? An M4 Sherman going off to war. I wonder which variant it is. Seems to be an easy 8. My great grandfather drove one of those. Near the center of the elven nation. On the commander's hatch of her night, Era took in the view of the mountain range. Some of the mountains reached the sky. A few hours ago. She had run into infantry from another unit and re-established contact with what was left of the high command. It seemed that her plans were almost exactly the same as the orders. Galath Mountain, Elven Nation. The Galath base was a large elven air force and army base cut into the mountain. It took 50 years to complete and was protected by a few thousand feet of stone. Magipanzers, Magitrox, small arms, and other weapons were stored in it. What was left of the entire air force was also there. It numbered less than 50 aircraft. The base even had living quarters for the soldiers and a network of bunkers jutting out of the mountain. Unlike most of the situation outside, the base was calm and hadn't been attacked. The only difference was the large influx of troops. Thousands of elven soldiers and vehicles were pouring into the mountains. Some set up their own bases while others came to the Galath base. Colonel General Alfred Adrora shook his head at his aide. I can't accommodate all of this. Get me in contact with the leader. Chapter 76, Battle of Philonias. 0700 May 15, 2020 CE. 0630 Sun 45th, 196 AE. Port City of Philonias. An M1A2 Abrams from the 1st ABCT took the lead. Bullets pinged off of the Abrams. Rockets landed on it and exploded. The machine guns on the Abrams fired at the shooting elves. 
Are these buildings confirmed hostile? Yes, they are shooting at us from the windows. An A1Z Viper flew over and hovered a few yards behind the lead Abrams. Its 20mm three-barreled rotary gun opened up on the elves in the buildings. It raked the windows of the side of the building. Bricks and glass were ripped apart as bullets went through them. The Abrams fired an M908 obstacle reduction round at the barricade blocking the road and moved forwards. Bullets and rockets hit the front of the tank but it shrugged them off. The remote-controlled .50 Kel machine gun on the commander's hatch of the Abrams, a part of the Tusk, the urban survival kit, swiveled to the building to its right and opened fire. An elf shouted in panic. It's not doing anything. Why isn't it? The elves watched as the rockets from their PAM seemingly did nothing to the human Magi Panzer. A chopping noise was heard permeating the air. An elf in the window on a building pointed towards the hovering object. What is that? Suddenly bullets rained down on them. Gah! We have its sides exposed? Fire down onto it. Elves came out of the windows beside the Abrams. One of the elves readied their PAM. The machine gun on the turret of the Magi Panzer turned towards the elves at the window. The machine gun is turning by itself. What is this magic? The machine gun opened up. Convoys of American units moved into the surrounded city from all sides. The entire city basically had its back to an ocean. We got the windows suppressed. Clear the insides. Blake threw a flashbang into the building. It detonated and he rushed inside with Curtis and two other Marines of the squad right behind. Three armed civilians occupied the first floor of the building and were quickly killed. They moved upstairs and quickly cleared half of the top floor. Curtis opened the door and stopped in his tracks. Blake, who was behind him, shouted at his sudden halt. Curtis, what are you doing? A shot from the elf child's pistol hit Curtis in the leg and he collapsed. Fuck. Curtis has been hit. Blake rushed forward and shot the boy. God damn it, Curtis. Why didn't you shoot? On the other side of the city, Isaac opened the door with his finger on the trigger. He aimed his M4 into the room. He nearly shot the cowering figure who had their hands up. Isaac was somewhat surprised to see a surrendering elf. He shouted to the others behind him. We got an elf surrendering. This was only the third one. Isaac slowly moved towards the figure with his gun raised. He soon noticed that the figure had human ears. It's a human. A few blocks away. Renaud didn't really know what to do. A heavy amount of gunfire could be heard outside. He hid in the room that was assigned to him and prayed that his master didn't show up to shoot him. If the elves were losing, he would likely be executed to prevent him from becoming free. He also hoped that the invaders were humans. 0824 May 15, 2020 CE. 0712 Sun 45th, 196 AE. A very old looking elf sat on a small wooden box outside of his house. He smoked a pipe. A shout came from the window of the second floor of his house. Fenno, get inside. He continued smoking. Fenno. Fenno glanced up at his much younger friend. I'm 197. I don't have a family. I don't care about your silly little war. You are going to die out there. If I die, I die. I will welcome a bullet anytime. Not like I'm going to live any longer than a few more years. Fine. The window above slammed shut. A few minutes later, Fenno sat there as bullets whizzed around him. However, none of them hit him. Either the humans had terrible accuracy or they didn't care about him. Fenno blew a puff of smoke. A soldier looked down his scope and stopped. There's an old-looking elf sitting outside of the house. Is he armed? No. He's just smoking a pipe. The squad leader hesitated. Almost all of the elves that they had encountered put up a fight or were armed. He was worried that the old elf was hiding a grenade and would detonate it if they got close. Don't shoot him then. Focus fire on the armed ones. Stay clear of him though and keep an eye on him. House-to-house -house combat raged on. Rogers conversed with one of his company commanders. The infantry is taking casualties trying to clear the houses. My tank has taken multiple RPG shots. You are free to destroy any hostile buildings with tank rounds. 0833 May 15, 
2020 CE. 0716 Sun 45th, 196 AE. An M1A2 Abrams aimed at one of the houses where a lot of small arms fire had been coming from. An M908 punched a hole in the wall of the house. Within seconds, the entire house collapsed into a heap of stone. A Hellfire missile from an A1Z blew open the top floor of a building. Its rotary cannon swept the inside and shredded the surviving elves. 0955 May 15, 2020 CE. 0757 Sun 45th, 196 AE. Brandon McKee stood next to an Humvee. Holding a microphone, he looked at the camera. As you can see behind me, intense fighting has broken out in this elven port city. U.S. forces are trying to secure a port for ships to dock at but have encountered heavy resistance. I have been informed that this isn't the elven military but armed civilians who are fighting. A large explosion was heard in the background and Brandon looked behind. A building was just blown up in the city. Not sure if it was done by the elven civilians or U.S. forces. Fighting has been going on for the last three hours with no end in sight. 1108 May 15, 2020 CE. 0834 Sun 45th, 196 AE. The sun started to set but the fighting raged on. Albury's platoon came to a halt and pulled back for a moment of rest and to quickly eat their dinners. Blake leaned against a wall as he munched on his MRE. They are arming their children now. Curtis was shot in the leg by an elven kid. He's doing fine currently. Finn sighed. Blake continued. Also we found a few humans who had been kept as slaves. Well, good thing we didn't blow this place up. Blake shrugged. Probably acceptable casualties at this point. Finn raised one of his eyebrows. This isn't a video game. There are elves who don't want to fight. You got quite a few surrendering didn't you? They were just forced into doing it so they weren't lynched by their own people. I know but one day of fighting and we have already lost around 30 men in total fighting for just this one city. In wars like these, it's hard to distinguish who's good and who's bad. Nothing different from what we experienced in Afghanistan or Iraq. Blake felt irked by that. It's different? It totally is? You know it too. We were in Afghanistan. It wasn't this bad. It was never this bad. Not every single Afghan took up arms against us. It was only a few badas hidden among a majority of innocent people. The opposite is true here. The majority of elves here are out to kill us. Do you really want to forsake those who are innocent? Stop living in your dream world Finn. I'm not living in my dream world. I know what war is. It's suffering. It's pain. But to resort to killing innocent people. Blake interrupted in anger. The lives we save by bombing this entire place to oblivion will outweigh the innocents that will be killed. Finn took a deep breath. Even if we argue about it here, what will this even change? We are mere grunts. Blake sat down. Those damn elves. Annalise snapped her fingers. This is the best time to strike. The fighting has died down and the darkness will cover our movements. The four other elves nodded. Anali looked at one of the elves. Goraz, you have gathered the explosives right. Five bundles of explosive mana. Enough to destroy any Magipanzers. If we stick them onto the human Magipanzers sides, we are sure to destroy them. Ready. Anali swept her determined eyes across the four other elves. They nodded. Let's go. The atmosphere outside was tense. Many battle-weary elves rested here near the front. The wounded were also being tended here. Avoiding the streets where intense fighting was occurring and using their knowledge of the alleys to navigate, they were able to move past the front line. It was a perfect night with the moon shrouded by clouds. Anil stopped. This should be human territory. Keep away from any lights and stay in the dark. Before they knew it, Flashes started and the sound of gunfire erupted. Goraz was shot in the head and fell backward. Anil panicked. What? How did they see us? She was soon cut down with the others. Isak looked over at a dark corner. I think I saw some movement through my NVGs. One of his squad mates confirmed it. Elves, they are carrying weapons. One of them seems to have bundles of dynamite. 
Jacob looked and confirmed before nodding. You are all free to fire. Chapter 77, A Literal Slugfest. 1350 May 15, 2020 CE. 0955 Sun 45th, 196 A. Port City of Philonias. Isaac snorted in annoyance. Seems to be a bunch of elven civilians who tried to blow us up with dynamite. Isaac's team leader, Andrew Bennett shook his head. Sheesh, we can't get any rest. Corey Sharp, the team leader of the other team of the squad, commented. Well, at least most of the fighting has died down. The elves can't see us. Jacob shrugged and waved forward. Still good to have a technological advantage. Come on, let's go. As they walked down the road, Isaac spoke again. Do you know what's surprising? Andrew looked at Isaac. What? We haven't seen a single elven military personnel. I think the fucking elven civilians got abandoned. Hmm. Probably. Unless they are all fighting in plain clothes. Jacob nodded. They seem more like civilians. Heck they don't seem to even know our weapon capabilities. Isaac chuckled. Do they even know they got abandoned? Well, they are probably so fanatic they don't even care that their entire military abandoned them. The fighting had died down so Fionn decided to go on his usual nightly stroll. His friend had died and he was all alone. He walked past a few human soldiers wearing strange things on their heads that covered their eyes. One of the human soldiers spoke to the other. Hey, arrest that old elf. He hasn't done anything wrong though. Who knows, he could be hiding something. I'm not taking any chances. Fionn only stared as the human approached him with a gun pointed at him. Fionn raised his hands slowly. The human grabbed him. A few hours earlier, he shook his head as he stared at his dead friend. He didn't bend down since he knew he probably won't be able to stand back up that easily. You would have probably lived if you didn't decide to fight. He was surprised that the humans didn't kill him and just ignored him. He thought he would have been surely dead by now, if not for a human actually killing him, then by an accidental shot or stray bullet. Present. The city was completely pitch black, the Magi batteries that powered the city had been destroyed during the battle. About a few decades ago, large Magi batteries were built outside of cities. They were fueled daily by elves who had time and wanted some money. Elves were paid every time they came to fuel the Magi batteries and there would usually be many filled Magi batteries in reserve. Although they were not targeted by airstrikes since they seemed to be just large metal boxes, the battle had destroyed many of them. Using the light given off by those with fire magic, nurses and doctors tended to the wounded. Half a street was filled with the wounded. An uninjured elf ran into the street and started shouting, Get out of here. Go. A nearby nurse confronted him. What? Why? We have a lot of injured here. He pointed back to where he came from. The humans are advancing. The nurse blinked in surprise. It's the middle of the night. I know. They don't seem bothered by it and they can see us. We tried to ambush them using the darkness but it didn't work. Hearing this, the nurses and doctors started rushing. Move these patients. Come quickly. Get the stretchers. Suddenly, they heard a chopping noise. The uninjured elf shouted in a panic. Take cover? Human aircraft. The pilot looked at the ground from his A1Z Viper. This is Hawk 1 to 3. Seems to be medical personnel tending to the wounded down there. We will refrain from firing on this area. Over. Copy that. Proceed with your scouting. A rocket shot towards the Viper. The pilot's eyes widened. Shit. RPG. The Viper banked to the left and the rocket narrowly missed. Another rocket flew towards them and missed also. We are under heavy fire from RPGs. We are getting out of here. The Viper reeled back and turned. On the ground. Finn looked around at his weary squad. We are only a few blocks into the city. At this point, it's gonna take us a week to reach the center. One of his squadmates shrugs. The elves would lose their will to fight sooner or later. If we deal enough casualties, they will probably give up. I hate fanatics. You can say that again. 1444 May 15, 2020 CE. 1022 Sun 45th, 
196 AE, outside of the city. Brandon waved to the city behind him. The sound of gunfire made it hard to hear what he was saying. You can see that even during the night, the battle continues to be raged. Here I have been told that we have a distinct advantage with night vision goggles. Most of the soldiers around me have them on. I'm currently hoping to be able to get into the city but have been stopped from doing so. Flashes of light came from the city. An explosion rocked the sky. Brandon looked behind him as he saw soldiers pointing towards the area. Oh my god. Is that a helicopter? A few minutes earlier, an elf peeked out the window. He had been able to remain hidden in his house without the humans finding him. He looked up into the sky and tightly held his Pam. An A1Z hovered in the sky above the city. The battle raged a couple blocks further into the city. Hold position. Prepare to support your street. Stay sharp and stay as far back as you can. The elves might fire RPGs at you. Understood, we will, aw oh fuck. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Our tail rotor got hit by an RPG, we are going down. F.U.C. The Viper started spinning out of control as its tail rotor was in flames. It crashed into a building beside it. Washington, D.C. 30 casualties in a day for a couple of blocks of a city. We also lost an attack helicopter on fucking national television. General Quincy Griffith spoke in a raspy voice. The elves are fighting for every single street and almost every house. We have pulled back our A1ZS. He paused. We will continue taking heavy casualties if we don't do anything, Mr. President. I know what you are thinking, General. We are not leveling the city or any other city as a matter of fact. We aren't there to do an extermination. I'm allowing precision strikes on any houses with hostels in them. This won't be enough, sir. Give me the authorization to bomb the city at will and I guarantee our casualties would hit rock bottom. I will not approve that, sir. My men are dying here. I know. I'm the commander-in-chief. Those are my men too. Port City of Philonias. Fighting had stretched further into the night. The elves gave much more ground because they were exhausted and couldn't see that well in the darkness. Elves that tried to use fire magic to see were instantly shot. A joint terminal attack controller, JTAC, set down his laser designator. I'm painting the house. Keep it on there. Intense amounts of gunfire had been pouring out from the house and with the lack of support, the marines haven't been able to push through it. A jet zipped through the sky above Brandon. A pilot surveyed the ground as his AV-8B Harrier II got closer and closer to the city. The AV-8B Harrier II is quite an old plane and has been with the Marines since 1985. However, it was the only jet in the U.S. arsenal other than the F-35B that could do vertical takeoff. The last of the Harrier IIS were planned to be retired by 2025. A GBU-12 dropped out from the Harrier over the city. It started directing itself towards the laser. A blast soon destroyed the building that the laser had pointed at. A group of elves stood together conversing with each other with worried tones. Human soldiers stood around them on guard. One of the human soldiers talked to the other. Why do we have so many elves here? Some of them surrendered and some of them didn't even fight. Why are we rounding up the ones who didn't even fight? Precautions. They all seem to be fanatics. So how is this gonna work? From what I have heard, we are gonna assign them houses away from the front and keep an eye on them. Keeps them safe from the fighting and allows us to keep ourselves safe. What about the slaves we freed? Where are they? They will also be assigned housing but there will be helicopters coming after the battle is over to evac them. 1048 Sun 45th, 196 AE a prison in the Magus Imperium. Simon sat in his prison cell hungry. He wasn't sure what the time was since he had no windows in his cell but he was pretty sure it was night. The humans had given him very little food. But he was among the lucky ones. He hasn't been beaten by the guard yet. A lot of elves in the prison had bruises on them. The prison was also spacious enough to handle almost all the elves so it wasn't cramped. He read a newspaper that was given to him. Although newspapers were published every day, the guards only handed them out once in a while. Sometimes the news was old. 
This time, he had a recent paper. Emblazoned on the top of the front page in the human imperial language was Invasion of the Elven Nation has begun. It talked about how the U.S. and Magus forces are landing in the Elven Nation. As he read, he wondered when he could return home. Although he was single, he still had a mother and father home. He was greatly worried about them, especially in this situation. Mountain ranges near the Galath Mountain. In the darkness of the night, elves moved about making fortifications and placing sandbags. Anti-Magi Panzer Thuguns were put into fortified positions. Anti-aircraft Thuguns kept an eye on the sky. Every route into the mountains was being blocked with layers and layers of defenses. In green areas, leaves and grass were thrown onto large weapons. In the more frigid and snowy areas, white-colored sheets were placed on. Chapter 78 Protests 0733 May 16, 2020 CE, Washington, D.C. Ronell threw the President's daily brief on the table after reading through it. Why am I being told that people are organizing protests against the war? There seem to be people who really like elves and see it as something like their fantasy dream come true. So they can't bear seeing elves getting killed. Weird. But it shouldn't cause protest movements that number in the hundreds in some places. There are also some who are sympathetic to the elves and pity them. We even have people complaining about our technological advantage over them and how it's not fair. There have even been comparisons to Europeans and Native Americans. Ronell stayed silent for a bit before taking a deep breath. They are fucking Nazis. They literally want to wipe out and enslave all of humanity. There are people who are calling it fake news and propaganda. You know, sometimes, I lose hope in humanity. And this is one of the times. 1022 May 16, 2020 CE. 1322 May 16, 2020 CE. San Francisco, United States of America. There is currently a major protest ongoing in San Francisco. You can see it right now behind me. A few hundred people are marching in protest of the current war against the elves. On the screen, a news reporter can be shown with people crowding the streets behind him. Signs that say save the elves, stop killing elves, stop massacring the natives, and pull out now can be seen among the crowd. A couple of people held megaphones and shouted their messages. The news reporter got the attention of one of the protesters. Sir, I'm with Channel 29 News. May I ask why you are protesting the war against the elves? He pressed the microphone towards the protester. I'm sick and tired of the government getting us into one war after another. What do you think about the reports and evidence that indicate that the elves have massacred and enslaved native humans? The protester started to look agitated. That's clearly propaganda by the government. Don't you see? The government does this every time it wants people to support their stupid war? WMDs for Iraq. 9-11 for Afghanistan. Now, these made-up massacre stories for the elves. Fake? All fake? The people are sheep. They have to wake up. So you don't believe that 9-11 happened? No. Of course, it did. It was an inside job. The government did it themselves in order to get us into a war to get oil. Another protester came by and overheard the last few bits of the conversation. That's the stupidest thing I have ever heard. Oh, are you one of them government collaborators? Must be a spy. Hey guys, this girl is a government spy. Looking offended, the girl replied. I'm here protesting this war just like you. The news reporter instantly turned his attention to her. And what are your thoughts on this? Oh, I'm a pacifist. This is just like what happened between the Europeans and Native Americans. I want to prevent a repeat of that. We can negotiate with the elves to find a peaceful solution to our problems. Warfare isn't the solution to everything. You have heard of reports of elves enslaving the native humans, correct? There have been comparisons of the actions of the elves to Nazis. I think the elves and us humans have gotten off of the wrong foot here. We have shown the elves our technological superiority and pushed them out of the Magus. The war should be over by now. I don't believe we need to actually invade the elves' homeland. We can coexist. We just need to talk it out with each other. 
It was the perfect opportunity to do so when the elves retreated back to their homeland. I fear it is a bit too late now though. Thank you for your comments. The reporter turned to the camera. Although folks here seem to have a wide range of opinions, they all agree on the fact that the war should end. 1520 May 15, 2020 CE. 1040 Sun 45th, 196 AE. Port city of Philonias. On the road was the flaming wreck of an Awanzi. Surprisingly, it was still somewhat intact. The rotor blades and tail boom were completely gone but the front suffered only a few crumples. Marines started showing up. One of the Marines got near the cockpit that had both the co-pilot and pilot in it. The pilot is still alive. Get him out of there. Good thing he crashed within friendly territory. Now quickly, I don't like these flames. The commanding Marine turned his head. We need a medic here. Further in the city. Renaud cowered in his room as a large number of gunshots rang out very close by. Flashes of light could be seen through his window. He peered through the windows to barely see weirdly dressed beings in the darkness. They had strange things covering their eyes. One of them instantly noticed him and raised their gun at him. Renaud shot his hands up. Don't shoot. I'm human. Renaud hoped his words could save him and that those strange beings were human too. The beings lowered their guns and approached him. Human. The strange being checked out his ears as Renaud quickly nodded. The strange being kindly smiled. We are here to help. The battle raged through the night and US forces made significant gains in the city. With the expectation of a few left behind, almost all the elves were civilians. There were veterans but there was nobody to coordinate or lead them. They had no ability to launch a counterattack or to organize a steadfast defense. However, they defended every single street and many fought to the bitter end. Every few yards, the US forces met heavy resistance. However, any defenses that the infantry couldn't get through were cleared with precision strikes from the sky. The elves were completely unprepared for a night battle and were caught off guard on how well the Americans were able to fight in the night. 0044 May 16, 2020 CE. 0322 Sun 46, 196 AE. By morning, the infantry could nearly see the port from the streets. Blake looked at Finn. Fucking hell. We are nearly there. This took much less than what you said it would take. Someone further away shouted. They are surrendering. A group of ten elves slowly walked towards them with their hands in the air. It was the largest amount of elves that had surrendered together. Blake, Finn, and the others kept their guns ready. Drop all of your weapons. Rifles, pistols, and grenades clattered onto the floor. A soldier closed in on the elves. Stay calm and do not resist. You will be searched. Finn relaxed. He was quite glad that the language barrier here wasn't that bad when compared to Afghanistan. Latin wasn't really a hard language to learn. Over 60% of English words are Latin-based. Quite a few of the soldiers had picked Latin as a second language during their high school years so they were fast to pick it up too. 20 minutes later, fighting still continued as they moved ever closer to the port. Blake witnessed more and more elves surrendering. Finn looked over a corner. Seems like we got a few more surrendering. A group of elves walked towards them with their hands in the air. One of the elves threw something at their feet. Grenade? Get down. Motherfucker. Blake dived to the ground. An explosion rocked his world. Getting up and dusting himself off, Blake took a look at where the elves were. Body parts and a pool of red blood were all that was left of the four elves. Blake shook his head. Fucking hell. Good thing Curtis isn't here. He won't like the sight of this. They are fucking suicide bombing. Finn looked around. Everybody fine. All good. Well good thing they suck at suicide bombing. Finn took a swig from his canteen. He leaned beside a crate. Black smoke billowed into the sky from the city. Finally. It's mostly over. Blake sat down on the grey concrete of the port. Where has Curtis been anyways? I think in the rear. He might get discharged for mental health issues. He really didn't take this well. I do hope he's fine. 
two MV-22 Ospreys came over the horizon and got closer and closer. They started landing onto the ground outside of the city. Grass billowed as the powerful rotor created gusts of wind. The Magasian civilians, freed from their slavery were led towards the Ospreys. They formed a line behind the opened back doors of the Ospreys. The Magasians murmured amongst themselves while looking at the strange aircraft. One of the Magasians, Freire Rayolette, eyed the strange aircraft with a sparkle in his eyes. Interesting. Two propellers on the wings. And they can fold up and down. An American soldier shouted to them at the door of the Osprey. Let's go, let's go, get on and make yourself comfortable. We are bringing y'all back home. Renault sat down on a seat in the weird aircraft. He heaved a sigh of relief and couldn't even believe all this had happened. It felt akin to a dream. He hoped that his parents and sister were okay. 1534 May 16, 2020 CE, Washington, D.C. One of Ronell's senior advisors for the 2020 elections, Felipe Tiffany, entered the Oval Office. Ronell looked up. Ah, Felipe, how can I help you? Felipe had a concerned look on his face. A new third party just formed Mr. President. Hmm. They call themselves the Peace Party. Ronell sighed. Let me guess. They oppose the current war against the elves. Well, in addition to that, their website states that they are angry and shocked at the number of wars we have started only two years after appearing in the New World. Mr. President. To be truthful, I do also find it uncomfortable. We have been fighting so many wars. Well, we have to find a place in this world. It had been quite hostile to us. Anyways, it's only a third party. Shouldn't be that concerning. True but it has gained some popularity. Even though not large enough to be a concern yet. We will have to keep an eye on them. Ronell frowned. How am I doing in the primaries for my party? Still in the lead. You are nearly guaranteed to be the candidate. Who's in the lead for the other party right now? Still Max Snyder. Yes. He probably will be the candidate for the opposing party as predicted. Has he said anything about his policy on wars? Not yet. He's probably still gauging which position would benefit him. Well, I'm already this deep in. Our position is that we will fight wars when we have to. Felipe nodded. That's basically what most of us have decided to. How are the polls? What are they predicting right now? It's gonna be a close race, sir. Just like four years ago I guess. Chapter 79, Advance. 0155 May 16, 2020 CE. 0357 Sun 46, 196 AE. Port City of Philinias. Jacob stared out at the horizon whilst standing and carrying his gun. I see the first cargo ship. Isaac walked over. The port seems to be a bit small. As long as it can offload, we should be fine. Isaac glanced over at Jacob. Say, why did we even need a port? Couldn't they have just offloaded on the beach? We will be dropping cargo into the fucking water. These are civilian cargo ships, they can't do amphibious operations. We do have ships capable of amphibious stuff but there aren't enough of them to keep us supplied constantly. That cargo ship should be bringing in ammunition, food, and whatnot. Everything we need. Crates of supplies came off of the cargo ship. Ammunition, food, building materials, and much more. It wasn't long before a passenger ship also showed up and started offloading people. Jacob watched as the ships offloaded. Seems like we will be getting CBs too. What for? Modernizing the port probably. The CBs is a nickname for the naval construction battalions that form the naval construction force. In order for the port to accommodate more ships and speed up offloading, the CBs had been ordered to modernize it. Luckily, the battle did not damage the port area at all and because it was not a port that housed elven navy ships, it wasn't even struck by missiles. Ocean near the elven nation. Renault looked around as he got off the back of the aircraft. It didn't take long for him to realize that he was on a massive ship. It felt more like a metal island than a ship but it was definitely moving. The top of the ship was flat with the exception of a building to the right near the center of the ship. There seemed to be many aircraft sitting on the ship. Looking into the sea, 
Many other ships surrounded this ship. Renault followed the others. His curiosity wore off soon. For the entire flight, he had worried about his family. That didn't change even now. He couldn't forget his sister's laughter as they played around and his parents' smiling faces at the dinner table. The second Osprey soon landed on the USS Carl Vinson. Freire got off and glanced in awe around him. It didn't take him long to realize that this was an airfield. He watched as an aircraft took off. Amazing. The fact that the Americans were able to make an airfield go on sea awed him. Hearing his outburst, others turned to look at him in bemusement. Freire was sort of an outcast in his country. He was never invested in magic but much more focused on mechanical things. Of course, he wasn't being mistreated. Others were just surprised that he never tried to develop his magic skills. A uniformed person greeted them. Welcome. I'm Lieutenant Commander Jensen Lowe. Does anybody here have injuries? A show of hand please. A few magazines raised their hands. Okay, we will get you guys treated. How many of you guys are hungry? All of the magazines raised their hands. And fed. Okay for those who are injured, please follow my friend, Petty Officer Gerald Phillips. Jensen pointed towards Gerald. He will lead you to the med bay. Once you are treated, you will join the others in the cafeteria. Everybody else, follow me. Freire was amazed as he was led through the interior of the aircraft carrier and towards the cafeteria. The interior looked so much more well-polished than the ships that the Magus Imperium have. An hour later, after their meal, Jensen got all the Magusians' attention and made an announcement. We will be transporting all of you via aircraft back to your country. Your government will be providing ground transportation back to your homes. They also seem to be offering relocation and support services if you have lost your homes. I'm not sure about the specifics of that. You will have to ask your government. Any questions? Renault raised his hand. Jensen pointed at him. Yes. I have a family who has also been captured by the elves. Do you know if they have been rescued? Is there any way that I can find them? We have already rescued a few people but I'm not exactly sure if any of them are your family. I will bring up your issue with my commander. I think it will be best if you bring it up with your government. With the others, Freire was led to the aircraft that was supposed to take them home. This aircraft disappointed him a bit. It was sleeker but still similar to a Mackian bomber. The C-2 Greyhound lifted off of the aircraft carrier carrying all the Magusians. Freire had stared in wonder as the aircraft took off from a ship. A few seats down, Renault sat with an unhappy look on his face. 0224 May 16, 2020 CE. 0412 Sun 46, 196 AE. Port City of Philonias. Blake stood up and stretched. What do we do now? Finn glanced around the deserted street. Well, we are to garrison this city until further notice. M1A2 Abrams and Bradleys of the 1st ABCT moved in an orderly fashion out of town. Elements of the 2nd Marines also followed. An hour or so later, Finn walked into a tent where the medics were tending to the wounded. How are you doing Curtis? Fine. Are you getting discharged? Not yet? Hmm. Don't go assuming things. Had a long chat with the psychologist. I'm staying. I'm a soldier. I have an obligation to you guys. Are you sure? There was a look of determination in Kittis's eyes. Yes. I'm sorry for having to deal with me. Finn sighed. It's all fine. Not everyone can handle this. You are a good man, maybe too good for war. Give me another chance, Sergeant. That's what I am doing. We have been garrisoned to protect this place until further notice. So rest up. Shouldn't be much to do for now. Surprised you haven't been sent back seeing that you got shot in the leg. Curtis smiled. Didn't penetrate. Just hurt like shit. Good to hear. 0700 May 16th, 2020 CE, Central Time. Nashville, Tennessee. Jack took a sip out of his coke as he watched the news. Counter-protests have been occurring in response to the recent anti-war protests. Members of both parties on Twitter have expressed their support for the continuation of the war. A few hours earlier, 
President Hayes addressed the American people, saying that he firmly stands behind the war, and saying that the elves are fanatics worse than the Japanese in World War II and that this war is necessary to prevent the loss of innocent lives. Joining us today is political analyst Bill Escuro. Bill, thank you for joining us today. What do you think of these current protests and the pushback it's experiencing? It's my pleasure to be here. Well, the current protests are actually quite normal. For any war, they are bound to be protests. In every recent war in American history, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, there were mass protests. I'm not surprised about this at all. However, what is interesting is the significant opposition that these protests are experiencing. It's quite unprecedented. So is this surprising seeing that it's unprecedented? No, no, it's not surprising at all. The fact that these elves are literally enslaving and massacring humans has created a negative public opinion of the elves and reduced the scale of the protests we are currently having. So what can we expect in the future? As you said, there has been a lot of pushback from the public about these anti-war protests. I really don't expect any significant protests but there definitely will be. Jack switched the channel to another news network. It was substantial. It was overwhelming. Yet it was ignored by these Antifa. These people, Antifa, have a clear anti-American agenda. They are trying to undermine our country in any way possible. They are protesting the sacrifices made by our soldiers who protect us. They are. Huh. This is one of the few times that I have actually seen these two news channels kinda actually agreeing on something, Jack muttered to himself as he turned off the television. 0850 May 16, 2020 CE. 0725 Sun 46, 196 AE. A few miles further into the Elven Nation. The forest soon gave way to hilly but treeless terrain. Dust came out of the back of the two Bradleys as they drove down the road. It was quite a large road and led to the next city a few hundred miles away. In the lead Bradley, the driver, without taking his eyes off of the road, spoke to his commander, Staff Sergeant Clyde McKinney. I don't feel that safe here. We are only two Bradleys. Nothing to worry about. We have an armor company right behind us and three combined arms battalions further behind. We are just scouts, we can pull back whenever things get iffy. Just continue driving down the road. Okay, sir. Stop, Clyde shouted to his driver. The two Bradleys came to a halt. Clyde looked through his imaging system and scanned the town miles in front of him. Small town. The road cuts right through it. Seems to be armed civilians again. Probably need to secure it so the main force can use this road. Clyde got on his radio. The town in our route is defended by armed civilians. The town doesn't seem bigger than a hundred or so people. I probably need a tank platoon here to help clear it out. A few minutes later. Staff Sergeant McKinney. Yep. Second Lieutenant Bob Craig. What's the situation here? Just a town with a few elves, nothing too much. My platoon will lead then. The four Abrams formed into a wedge formation as they drove towards the town. Rifle shots pinged off of the lead Abrams. They came to a stop. The machine guns on the Abrams opened up on the elves. The boxes and furniture that the elves were hiding behind were torn apart. The Abrams formed a column formation on the road and moved into town. Feels like a ghost too. We have an elf that's surrendering in front of us. Can your boys secure him? Understood. Be careful, this might be an ambush. We'll keep an eye out. A total of six infantrymen came out of the two Bradleys. Clyde watched as the squad leader of the dismounted infantry shouted at the elf. The elf dropped all of his weapons. The soldiers moved in and quickly secured him. Just then, a few elves slowly came out of their houses. The infantry quickly reacted and aimed their guns at the elves. The elves all put their hands up. Twenty minutes later, the elves formed a line and threw their weapons down into a pile. It was only rifles, pistols, and submachine guns. Infantry stood around keeping an eye on the elves. Clyde mused to his driver. Seems like these townspeople are much less inclined to fight. We killed like what? Ten elves. 
This feels so much different from the city. The entire town was secured in less than an hour and all the weapons were confiscated. The two Bradleys continued on with their reconnaissance. Chapter 80, Genocide or War 0936 May 16, 2020 CE 0748 Sun 46, 196 A. Washington, D.C. General Griffith, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, conversed with President Hayes the towns further away from the cities have surrendered much more easily. The recon forces have been able to take them mostly by themselves. Compared to cities, it's likely that they haven't been bombarded constantly by propaganda. We should be able to expect only minimal resistance from them. Mr. President, we should be besieging the cities from now on. Directly assaulting them would just be a gross waste of lives when we can just force them into submission or at least weaken them through air and artillery strikes. General, we will just be engaging in genocide at that point. We will give them time and allow any civilians to leave. If there even are any that can be considered civilians, do you really think anybody will leave? And what about the humans they are keeping as slaves? How will the media react when they learn we literally have forsaken them? It will be a humanitarian disaster. Humanitarian disaster. Boohoo. Who cares? There is no international community to criticize us anymore. Public opinion is already souring because of the large loss of life we are experiencing. It's only been a few days into the invasion and we have already suffered 50% of the total casualties we have suffered during the entire Gulf War. I'm gonna be blamed for the entire thing, God damn it. And you can say bye to your career at that point. In war, we have to kill our enemies. That's the military's job. To kill the enemy and you are stopping me from doing their job. These so-called civilians are all armed to the teeth. We are not barbarians. General. There are established rules of war. Bah. Rules. When did wars have rules? The elves don't even follow them. Mr. President. Make the right choice here. Let the military off this goddamn idiotic leash. Now get out of my office. You have been coming here every single fucking day. You have been a great advisor in the past but I'm very close to removing you Quincy. A few miles away from the Orva Saelera human concentration camp, the grass billowed as 20 MV-22 Ospreys touched down onto the plains. Surrounding the landing area were M1A2 Abrams and hemp trucks. Cylindrical tanks full of aviation fuel were on the back of the HEMTTs. Soldiers rushed to connect the fuel hoses from the HEMTTs to the Ospreys. Once refueled, it was only a short journey from there to the Orva Saelera human concentration camp. A few minutes later, Orva Saelera human concentration camp, Damon shouted at the Magasians, Stay in your groups, we will be evacuating you soon. The sound of the MV-22 Ospreys got louder and louder. The first one soon appeared and landed in a clearing in the concentration camp. Get on in an orderly fashion? Please put all your baggage on the floor. Once you have sat down, please do not get up unless instructed to do so. As each osprey filled up with magazines, dust was kicked up by the rotors and they took off one by one. What was a bleak concentration camp had been completely transformed. In the past few days, the rangers and the green berets had turned the concentration camp nearly into a fob, forward operating base. Well, the army should be arriving soon. Guess we will be welcoming them. Less than an hour later, I see two Bradleys. The recon force is here. The two Bradleys came to a stop and the commander at the lead Bradley popped out of his hatch. The commander grinned. Nice place you have here. Damon laughed. Welcome to our humble abode. Somewhere in the elven nation. Stop. Elven military convoy over to the northeast. Multiple magi trucks followed by a single guard tank raced down the paved road. The two Bradleys that pulled onto a grassy hilltop spied on them. I'm calling in an airstrike. Let's tail them and see how it goes. The two Bradleys sped down the hill and through the grass. They kept the elven convoy that was on the road in sight but kept a distance. A few minutes later, an F-15 flew over the elven convoy. The noise of the F-15 flying over was still reverberating when multiple large explosions wiped the convoy out. 
blackened dirt and the mangled, charred metal wrecks were all that remained. Woo, baby. An explosion occurred underneath the track of the lead Bradley. Ah oh, fuck. Mine. The Bradley behind came to a stop. The commander of the lead Bradley opened his hatch and looked over the side. Tracks bust. 0810 Sun 46th, 196A. Most forces have been repositioned into the mountains. We have lost hundreds of vehicles and elves to American bombing attacks. We have also been receiving bombing runs on the mountains but I don't believe they have discovered our main base here yet. Terran clasped his hands together. Gentle elves. We shall hold this position to the last elf. Anna Falen raised his voice in opposition. My leader, I don't think that's advisable. The Americans are perfectly capable of wiping out our concentrated forces. In fact, I won't be surprised if their military has been made to destroy a concentration of units. It is more advisable if we spread out instead of staying here. That will make us a much harder target to kill. Terran frowned and his eyes narrowed. Then who will keep an organized command of the units? How will we perform organized defenses and counterattacks? Uh, we don't sir. The point is, we aim for our survival. Terran spread his arm around. This mountain is the perfect terrain for defense and will be the staging area of our counteroffensive. Our main base is under hundreds of feet of solid stone. I don't believe the Americans have the capability of destroying that. Understood. The various department heads and the general staff nodded in agreement. Terran smiled, dismissed. And also, Anna Falen, I would like to see you in your office. A few minutes later, Terran sat down in Anne Falen's chair in his office. I told you before, you are getting on my nerves. My leader, I'm only giving sensible advice. I only need you to do as I say. That's your job. You manage the Department of Intelligence. That's all. I'm also an advisor. I don't need time for advice. Everything is already in motion. Anne Falen didn't respond for a few seconds before nodding. Yes, my leader. Terran exited the room. Anne Falen sat down and a worried force grew on his face. His wife was also in the base with him but he had no heart to go see her. He had noticed that Terran had changed ever since they abandoned the capital and it greatly concerned him. Terran seemed to be angrier and was much less willing to listen to others. What should I do? What should I do? He whispered over and over again as his mind played out his options. 1046 May 16, 2020 CE. 0823 Sun 46, 196 AE. Port City of Philonias. M109A6 howitzers were taken off of the cargo ship. Finn's eyes followed the self-propelled howitzers. 1 ST Infantry Division Artillery. Blake looked over. Where's the rest of the 1st Infantry? Probably on the way. Docked a few feet away from the cargo ship was a WW1-style transport ship. A tank rolled off of it. Blake whistled wow. A fucking M4 Sherman. Finn nodded. The Magasians are here. How effective are they even gonna be? Probably just gonna be filler or something. Maybe garrisoning the towns. Do you think the brass will even trust them with that? Finn chuckled. I feel bad for them if they get sent to the front line. M4 Shermans are quite easy to kill. MacDill Air Force Base, Tampa, Florida. General Abrams Thompson, commander of the U.S. New World Command, conversed with his staff. Other than retreating units and stragglers. The planes are mostly clear of enemy units. This is a good situation. Our units are starting to get stretched thin. The 2nd Armored Brigade Combat Team from the 1st Infantry Division and the 1st Infantry Brigade Combat Team from the 10th Mountain Division are arriving. The Magasians are also arriving and they will be under our guidance. Most of the Elven forces have retreated to the mountains. We have lost sight of them but we are sure that there will be heavy fortifications on the mountains and that they are holed up there. Abrams nodded. Increase drone surveillance on that. Prepare for airstrikes on that region. Depending on how heavily they are fortified, we might need to get a Moab out for this one. Port City of Yalin, Elven Nation. Elements of the 1st ABCT of the 1st Armored Division surrounded the port city. 
They kept their distance and had screening forces keeping an eye out. In his house, Lorson felt panic coursing through his blood. He knew that all the articles that he had read about their recent glorious victories were most likely lies. He sat down eating with a gun leaning against his table. The humans had his city surrounded and there was no way out.